participated, planned, uh, run around, organising, carrying things, uh, picking people up from airports. I particularly want to thank the team choir who many of you couldn't stay for the test yesterday. Jesus. 
Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbour as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this, and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbour? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he travelled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins, gave it to them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbour to the man who fell in the hands of robbers? The expert of the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus said, go and do likewise. And I think it's true that everybody is our neighbour. So even when we send money overseas, we are helping our neighbours. But there's something very particular about the Samaritan touching that individual's life. He personally bandaged him. He personally cleaved his wounds. He personally took him to an inn. He personally paid and then promised to pay more. And he took personal responsibility and care in a, in a very direct way. Yeah. And he had the opportunity to give his own love. And, and, and we're called to do all of these things, I believe. I believe we should give money overseas because we see incredible hardship in these places and we should respond. Absolutely. But we're also called to respond when we see it next to us and not to walk by on the other side. You know, we're, we're very familiar. You know, the, the, the topic of our, our the, the, the theme of our conference or the title of us you invited to be in, and it was a sort of a reference to the fact that we're celebrating 20 years of Two Step and ODEP, and in Two Step we have a stopover host who we invite homeless people to their homes. And the thing about Matthew 25 is Jesus said, if you did this, you did it for me. And it would be possible for us to love our neighbours far away and, and still be walking past and missing Jesus next to us. And, and so we were called to do both. And in, the, in 1992, the church started wanting to deal with something that was really obvious, which was homelessness. And it was very common to see that on our streets. It's less common now. But it was, you know, when, in 1992, you couldn't go anywhere without seeing this sight on the streets. Men with big beards in, in winter clothes, no matter what time of year it was, in, in, in a bad state. And, and over time, different things happened. There was a planting to Bristol in 1992 that invited homeless people into their homes, which was a revolution. John Partington and Walter Evans, looking rather handsome there, I must say, slept rough on the street. I mean, how radical was that? And I remember it was in 1992, going to Leicester Square, really incredibly encouraged that I could bring my, my old clothes and bin liners to church, and that I could get rid of them, you know, so they could be used, used usefully in some way. And by 1993, the church employed someone to be a minister to the poor. And Two Step was born, ODAT was created, and, and we were serving the poor as a church, in our community, in front of us. And I've, there's a lot of lists here, and I'm not going to go through it all, but we were doing things overseas and in the UK, and cons cons continue to do that, do that consistently. Much of, much of what we did overseas was in the Asian sort of subcontinent, but in 1996, we started a project with Hope Online in the Zambia, the Capacitor Banjo Programme, which many of you support. And I want to introduce you to this lady, Precious. Precious was one of many women or girls or children who were orphaned in Zambia because of AIDS. I think it's something like 1.2 million orphans because of AIDS in Zambia. And she was one of them, and her parents died, and she went to live with her grandmother. But because her parents had died with AIDS, a lot of the community thought she might have it too. And 
in, in, in large parts of Africa, if you get AIDS, you get really ostracized. There's, people, there's a lot of fear um, in certain communities. You don't tell people you have AIDS, you just die. You, you much rather die than admit you have AIDS because you will, you will not be able to go down the street. And, and, and she was getting bullied and harassed. Her family were getting harassed. And she decided when she was 13 that she would run away from home. And she met someone who promised her a wonderful life, who actually tricked her into prostitution as a 13-year-old. And she lived for a while as a prostitute, as a slave. And she came to the Hope Worldwide, Hope Worldwide rescued her, brought her back to her family, gave her counselling. You can imagine the trauma that she's been through. Um, and now as a 17-year-old, she's a peer educator for other teenagers. She wants to become a social worker, and she's doing amazing things. And her life is, is transformed and going in a direction that is very positive. And things have continued. And there are many, many milestones. And on your seats, I'm not going to go through all of them, but there's a sheet with lots of milestones. You can read them and be encouraged and pray about it and thank God for it. But also on the other side of the sheet, there are loads of things we can do together. Because it's one thing for me to say, Hope World Wide is great, or Social Call is great, and then just leave it hanging in the air. But actually, there's loads of ways you can actually get involved as well. And, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but there, and there's a variety. And we've been guilty sometimes of saying the only way you can get involved is to stop over house or as a mentor, and that's it. But actually, there's loads of things you could do. And the chances are you could find some things to do that we haven't even thought about. And if you think of anything, let us know. But what we'd love to do is for us as a church to really continue to be a church that serves the poor. And although I'm presenting now about Hope Worldwide, you know, I'm, I'm standing here as a disciple believing that we need to serve the poor, not as someone who wants you to necessarily do it with only Hope Worldwide. The, the, the Bible doesn't say do it with Hope Worldwide. The Bible just says, Jesus went preaching, teaching and healing. You know, but what I want is, and what we would like, and, and I'm sure what's what we want in our own hearts is to just be really faithful disciples to be walking into Jesus' steps. And for us to just take the opportunities when they come and to see the moments and to, to have compassion and to be able to respond when we have opportunities to respond. Okay, great. There's, to this year we've uh, relaunched that original book. Uh, when Doug Arthur and Doug Jacobi wrote I Was Hungry, here it is, we called it, then the king will say. The first section of it is part of that book, but then we've updated it with other things, because that book was written before we did anything, collectively. And so much has happened since then. So we've got a section there from India, from that first love offering, to what is happening now. We've got a section in there well, from Mark Timlin and Kevin Eve, who were both in Afghanistan. And when you read it, it's miraculous. It's a, it's a miracle they're alive, you know? It's amazing that they're here today. It's, uh, it will build your faith to read that. There is a section in there about, even though, yes, we can do all these amazing things, we can do so much here in the UK. Amen. And there is a section by Randy Jordan, who's an elder in the Philadelphia Church. And also uh, Steve Kinnard is a, is a teacher in the New York Church um, about just walking in Jesus' steps. Please... Um, Buy this. We haven't brought them today because it's a nightmare here to do anything. Um, but we will sell these in the churches. Please buy this. Please read it. Please be inspired. And please allow your heart to respond and do something personally. Come on now. Um, I just want to well, really just thank the church for everything you've done. And just really, I want us to be able to celebrate that so many years ago, this church did something special. God used this church to make a massive international change. And I believe God will continue to use this church to do amazing things. We will have a collection today, and um, the collection will go towards Afghanistan, the work in Afghanistan, and towards some of the things that Mark shared about. So please give generously. We have a small project there at the moment. Um, it only has a budget until the end of July. Please give very generously if you can. And also, any profit from this book will also be going to the 